Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cantina Chatter Podcast. And before we get into the main part of our conversation with the First Order Roundtable, I did want to preface this by letting you know that this is a spoiler-filled conversation. If you have not yet seen The Last Jedi, stop listening now and go and watch it. That being said, on social media, I did ask for you to share your thoughts about The Last Jedi. I got quite a few responses, especially on Instagram, so I did want to go ahead and read through a few of those. I apologize in advance if I do not get to yours. I just got so many responses, and I only have time to read through a few that I thought were particularly interesting. From Ida Schatz, Perhaps Luke passed away because of Snoke's death. The Force needed to be balanced again. Very interesting thought, and that's not actually something I had considered, Um, but that's entirely possible. Very interesting thought there. Next one is from Darth Pete, who says, I thought The Last Jedi was awesome, broke new ground, and while it has similarities with Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, it felt completely different. Overall, it's probably one of my favorite out of the entire saga, but I will need many more additional viewings. Totally feel you there. Uh, A few similarities, of course, to both films, which was kind of expected, but it definitely broke new ground, as we will get into during our conversation here in just a bit. Next one comes from X Death Medic X. So my thoughts on The Last Jedi, it was the worst Star Wars movie of all time for me. It completely killed all my passion. So much I'm selling off my collection from the past years if it has a Disney logo on it. I will only collect original trilogy and prequel trilogy figures from now on. Basically I'm going for every variant in the vintage collection line. Oh well I can't say that I agree with any of that. I do respect your opinion and that is a very interesting one. One that does not line up with uh, any of the other responses I got from anyone else. Last one here, from Robert J. Walker, who says, Love the film. Only criticisms. Yoda's mouth was a little distracting. The puppetry from 79 to 83 was obviously hard to emulate. And sometimes the humor ruined the tone of certain scenes. Overall, a very enjoyable and groundbreaking Star Wars film. So I definitely hear you on the humor. I do have some issues myself with Yoda and the way that he looked at times. At times I thought he looked great. Again, this is something we'll get into in the roundtable conversation, but I certainly agree that it was an overall enjoyable and groundbreaking Star Wars film. In Star Wars collecting news, Tokyo Comic Con 2017 recently occurred, and at it were revealed many Bandai Tamashii Nation's SH Figure Arts figures, some of which had been seen before, but a large number of them which were brand new and uh, never before seen yet by any collectors, and some of them were super, super cool. Examples include Queen Amidala from The Phantom Menace, Anakin Skywalker from Revenge of the Sith with Sith eyes, Count Dooku, which looks absolutely stellar, and Jabba the Hutt, among many others. To see more of them, check out Victoria's Cantina on Instagram. In Victoria's Cantina-related news, Daily Figure on Instagram has recently crossed the threshold of 200 Star Wars action figures. Daily Figure showcases a brand new 3 3 quarter inch Star Wars action figure every single day, and we are well on our way to 300. And I feel like we've just scratched the surface with that, so stay tuned for many, many more. You are listening to the First Order Roundtable. Welcome to the 16th episode of the Cantina Chatter Podcast. I am Victoria, your host, and today we will be discussing our thoughts about Star Wars Episode 8, The Last Jedi. Joining me today are Steven, also known as Sith Lord 229 on YouTube and social media. Hi, Steven. Hello, thank you for having me. And Matt Brando from Brando Reviews on YouTube and social media, who has also been on the show before. Hey, Matt. Hello, my fellow First Order Legion. (laughs) And finally, we have a bonus guest, and that is my husband, Justin. Hey there, guys. 
All right, so I wanted to make sure that we had a well-rounded discussion that involved people with different points of view. And I didn't want this to be an all Star Wars fans or reviewers or collectors because then it would be a little more biased. So uh, as you know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan and collector. So I wanted to compare my thoughts with someone similar. And that is why I have Steve with us. And then we have Matt, who comes from more of a film background and education. And then we have my husband, who, if you can believe it, isn't a very big Star Wars fan. He's more of a general audience moviegoer and sees the movies mainly because I enjoy them. So this is his first time on Cantina Chatter, and it's actually his first time on any podcast. So I trust that this will be a good discussion regarding The Last Jedi for all of us. So guys, The Last Jedi is finally here. We've all seen it at least once, and I know some of us will be seeing it again and again and again (laughs) in some cases. Um, But based on our initial viewings, I'd like to start with a little bit of our initial thoughts without going too in depth because we will have time to do that in a little bit. So, Steve, let's start with you. What is your first impression of the film? Um, Throughout, while I was watching the film and throughout it, I was constantly on the edge of my seat. There were things that happened throughout the film that upon like like just taking everything in i didn't necessarily agree with and i was a little bit shocked by and after coming out of the cinema and, and trying to process everything that i would seen i i didn't know how i felt um because there were things that i was expecting to see that didn't happen there were things that i maybe would have done a little bit differently and i wasn't because it, it, i think the general consensus with this film is that it's it's so different it's such a it's a different star wars film and like I say, I just didn't really know how to feel. So that was my initial uh, sort of feeling and thoughts regarding it. But the more I've had time to process some of the stuff that I've seen and the more I'm, because I've, I've got my, my second viewing booked for in a, about a week's time. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing it again so that I can, so that now that I know what to expect and what, that, what I'm going to see, I can process that information and digest it a little bit better. Because when you see it for the first time, it's you, you're too busy sort of, trying to dissect everything and trying to take everything in so it's a little bit you miss things and you know you, you're shocked by things that don't happen or that do happen and it, it yeah I, I came out of the cinema speechless I didn't I was just like uh, 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 you know I didn't really know what to say about it or what to feel or what to think so but uh, after my second viewing I think my thoughts and and what have you will be a, a lot clearer right on awesome uh, Matt what is your first impression of the film um you know, I was watching the whole movie, and I think it was a different movie-going experience than The Force Awakens. I'm just going to say this. I love The Force Awakens. It's probably my second favorite besides uh, New Hope, and because they're a lot similar, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I came out of the theater very satisfied out of The Force Awakens. Um, for Rogue One, it was okay. But for this film, I, I don't want to label it the feeling of disappointing when i left it um because there's so much hype when a star wars film comes out especially an episodic one and uh i just watching the whole movie was a different theater experience than the force awakens was it wasn't like a uh like a, a fan service moment here and there and people went yay it was i just felt like it was a better story a better told story um i do like like the directing and stuff of last jedi but it in the theater itself too like Everyone was so, like, quiet and, like, maybe they were confused, too, and, like, oh, this is different, blah, 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 like everyone's been saying. Um, But it's just, like, people walked out and, like, yeah, it was, like, good, you know? Um, I I, I, I kind of agree with that. It's like, yeah, it was good, but I kind of, like, wince at it. So we'll talk about that. Right on. And, uh, Justin, what are your initial thoughts about The Last Jedi? Well, you know, not being like uh, Victoria said, the large, largest uh, Star Wars fan out there, I kind of just go in and when I go to a Star Wars movie, I kind of just go there with really uh, no expectations at all and just kind of, let's just, uh, you know, see if this is entertaining and see what happens here. So, you know, I think the scene I liked the most out of the movie was... We're not there yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what's your initial, initial impressions? I guess that's all. Okay, good job. <laughs> All right. Jump um, on the gun. <laughs> I think that, that that's a really interesting point, though, saying that you go into it without any expectations and just 
hoping to be entertained because I, I really wish that I could go into a Star Wars film feeling that way because right. you go in with so many expectations and you go in like as a, as a diehard Star Wars fan you go in thinking this is going to happen I want to see this I hope that this takes place and I think I think a lot of the reasons why maybe some people because you know based on the the, the the feedback that the film's had so far I think a lot of people sort of feel I'll not say indifferent towards it but there's a lot of um there's a lot of people who there's equal amounts of people who dislike it than like it. I think uh-huh. from reviews that I've read and what have you. And I think one of the things that probably makes people disappointed coming out of this film is the expectation that they have going in. And when that stuff that they're probably expected to see didn't happen, I think that might have sort of if they didn't have that expectation going in, maybe they would have come out of the cinema and out of the theater with a a different perception of the film. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a good point. So for me, I thought The Last Jedi was highly entertaining. I really liked it. Uh, I thought it did a good job of going beyond what was already familiar to us when we think about Star Wars. It wasn't afraid to take risks and break new ground. However, I do feel a little bit like Ray right now. I'm kind of trying to figure <laughs> out what its place is in all this. Where does it fit into the saga? How does it rank? Exactly how much do I like it compared to the other films in the series? Like, I need to see it more in order to have a better idea about these things. Um, Overall, I really enjoyed it and I thought it was quite solid, imperfect, and a little far out at times, but uh, it Mm -hmm. definitely worked for me overall. So the next thing I want to cover is things that we really enjoyed about the film. So guys, let me know what you enjoyed as well as your absolute favorite thing about The Last Jedi. So, Justin, I'll go ahead and begin with you. Okay, so for me, there was two things I, I that were memorable for me from the movie. Um, the first one was when Ray and Kylo Ren both took on the bad guy together. Apologize for not knowing names specifically, characters. I know that's <laughs> yeah. horrible, but but that was but that was an awesome fight sequence, and especially uh, whenever uh, she threw over the lightsaber to him, and then you know, he grabbed it and it activated it and poked out the other guy's eye. That was pretty pretty rad. Um, <laughs> good good scene there. Um, the other thing I just thought was hilarious was the scene, you know, because I was actually thinking about it, why they were on the island with Luke Skywalker and he's been on this island for so many years. And the thought actually crossed my mind, like, you know, they're never going to cover the detail how he actually survived on this island for so long. And then there's that scene, he walks down there and sticks a bottle in that thing's you know, <laughs> and got milk. And I was like, oh, that's... Uh, kind of unexpected (laughs) but it was funny i was thinking about that a a second before you know (laughs) and steven what about you favorite things about the film um i I, the things i really liked about it i mean it it was beautifully shot that's one of the the visual aspect of it was you know absolutely spot on luke skywalker as well and uh kylo ren mvps of the film for me um and the, the the amount of twists I think I think that the fact that it was so unexpected is the thing that I really like about this film because like a lot of people I went in there with a a, a, a mapped out scenario in my head of this is going to happen and I expect this is going to happen and this person is going to turn and that person is going to turn and this person is going to die and this person is going to live and the fact that every single expectation and every single theory and every single scenario that I planned out in my head prior to seeing the film didn't happen I liked that because it the unpredictability of it just it just threw me off completely and that's why that's one of the many reasons why I was just on the edge of my seat the whole way through because it, it like Luke says in the trailer and in the movie it didn't go the way we thought um, or at least the, the way I thought so that was for me was uh, one of the, my favorite aspects of it. I mean, there were there were certain scenes that I absolutely loved, like like Justin said, the the scene in the throne room with uh, Kylo Ren, Ray, and uh, Supreme Leader Snoke. That was really really good, uh, and again unexpected. So uh, yeah, that, the unpredictability I think is my favorite thing coming out of this film. Nice. And Matt, what about you? Uh, there is like a lot of great. Uh, elements that were introduced in the film like uh steven said if me personally if mark hamill doesn't put on a clinic everybody is talking about like kylo ren because like in voice awakens everyone's like oh he's just a whiny brat blah, blah. and this movie nobody i tweeted this like nobody is gonna say that after seeing last jedi like his character progression is like amazing he's now set up 
as like the most powerful force in the galaxy. It I, I just because I like Kylo Ren from the first film, and I'm so glad that Ryan did a great job writing and continuing and progressing him as a character. And I'm looking forward to the next one and seeing what happens. Uh, the coolest freaking thing I've seen was the force connection or the force communication they had with Ray and Kylo. I've never, I mean, I've seen all the Star Wars films, but I haven't read like all the books or comics or whatever. I'm pretty sure that's never been in any Star Wars story. And when I saw that for the first time and they kept going back at it, I was like, this is like the coolest thing I've seen in my life. Like, this is so awesome. And, they, and then, which is really cool about it also is the story that it wasn't them just like, you know, talking smack or whatever. Like, he's actually like, the, the plot of him trying to turn her and he tells her to, you know, find out about re what really happened. I was like, oh shit, what really happened, you know? And I really like the story of Luke and him being a recluse and him not caring because of what happened. And then he finally agrees to train Ray and then he sees Ray because she wants to know who her parents are. She just goes into the dark side. He's like, wow, you didn't even blink. And then doesn't want to train her anymore. I really like this tug of war. And I really like the overall story of The Last Jedi. I just, some of the plot or most of the plot, I just didn't like. Right on. So for me, uh, things that I, I really enjoyed. Um, anytime I go into a new Star Wars film, especially one of these uh, episodic films, uh, like with The Force Awakens, you know, I'm kind of on edge. My heart rate is up and I'm, you know, very like excited about what I'm going to see, a little bit uncertain. Um, so I really liked the kind of icebreaker that they had between um, Poe and um, Hux, like just kind of like the little banter they had going back and forth. I, I kind of needed that little icebreaker. So that was kind of fun. Uh, I do think it went on a little too long, but that's another thing altogether. Um, Mark Hamill's performance, I thought was absolutely stellar. I really enjoyed any time he was on screen, even though he, as a character, wasn't exactly what I maybe necessarily wanted to see at times. I, I just felt like he gave it his all, and that was amazing. Um, seeing Yoda again, um, I kind of thought maybe we would see Yoda. I didn't really think that it would be in this context necessarily, but I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, just the advice that he gave Luke that kind of you know set Luke off to changing his mind, I thought was pretty awesome. Um, like you guys said, uh, Adam Driver, uh, Kylo Ren, his performance, absolutely fantastic. I loved his character growth and getting a little more perspective on, you know, why he became the way that he did. Um, the team up between Ray and Kylo Ren, awesome. Love that entire scene. Uh, specifically the way that they killed Snoke off, um, just the way that that happened, I thought was really original and quite awesome. Um, I know a lot of people have an issue with Leia's little moment where she kind of, you know, fl like flying a little bit <laughs> like in yeah, space. Yeah, she's superman it. Yeah. I really like that. I mean, the way that they... She's Mary Poppins, yo. <laughs> totally. I mean, the way that they did it with Leia's theme, like the music, and it was just kind of like her moment in the film, and I really appreciated that. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps my favorite thing out of the entire thing, and, you know, it's kind of a small moment, but Luke and R2-D2, I loved seeing them together, and uh, more specifically, when R2-D2 projected Leia's image from A New Hope, that really got to me. Like, emotionally for me, that was, like, the biggest thing in the film. So I loved, loved, loved that so much. So next, uh, let's discuss the things that we liked least about The Last Jedi. So there were quite a few things that happened in this movie that were very different from what we've seen before, as you guys know. So I'm curious to see what you guys perhaps weren't too fond of. So Matt, let's go ahead and start with you here. Oh, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, when the movie ended, I went with two friends, and they were talking about the whole casino subplot, and I agree with them. They were like, "Oh, I hate that!" Like, and you can't take it out because the whole point of getting Benicio del Toro's character is there, and. Uh, might as well just jump into that. I'll skip ahead to Benicio del Toro. I didn't really like how he like turned on them, and the whole f it's like a symbol of like the whole film, including Laura Dern's character. Um, it's 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 like so nihilist, and 
I, I felt like this was like the darkest Star Wars film. And everyone, and I, remember, I saw some tweeter or some tweet of a YouTuber. He was like, this is a dark film, but it's not as dark as uh, Empire Strikes Back. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I feel like this film is like so like sorrow. And at least with Empire, I would see some bad stuff happen, but I would have hope somewhere in there or have some faith that like combats it. Like in Last Jedi, it was just like so depressing to watch. And like I never, I never really got that like glimmer of hope until like at the very end you get Ray with the Falcon. It's like, it I don't know. It was just like such a hard watch to compared to the especially to Force Awakens. I know they're going for a darker tone. You need to kind of have that. We need to Ray to have this plot line and her possibly to uh, turn you know to the dark side and who are her parents. And I, I man, I could go on and on about like what I don't like. Like I don't like how Snoke was just nothing how ray's parents she's a she's a nobody i mean yeah fans speculated but i mean they're fans they're speculate that that means they have interest in the content like i feel like they made those creative decisions just to stick it to the fans like i don't know but there's also a flip side to that saying hey maybe you can be like ray and she's like a symbol of the american dream where you a nobody can go from rags to riches and so she came from drunk junkers on a junk planet to becoming like the second most or most powerful jedi in the galaxy so it, it's tough it, the film i've said this to people yes the film is different um but for me i feel like it's the wrong kind of different so that's like in a nutshell, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I uh, disliked. And I can add on to what you guys say, too. <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you make a really good point there um, about a couple of things. Uh, for me, personally, the uh, Benicia Del Toro thing, DJ, uh, I had a few issues with his characterization. I'm, I, I, at times, I couldn't really understand what he was saying. So, I mean, when I can understand what a character is saying, to me, that's a big deal. Um uh, I mentioned Poe and Hux at the, the beginning and how that was kind of an icebreaker. I appreciated that, but I kind of felt like it went on a little bit too long. Like once it got to the point of, oh, or, you know, he's this pasty looking guy and, uh, oh, there was like a Yo Mama joke in there. It's like, really? It's like, did it need to go that far? Um, let's see what else. Um, uh, there was the, at the end when uh, Luke came out and he went to go for, confront uh, the entire First Order on his own and um, the resistance was kind of like, oh, well, you, you know, what's he doing? Oh, oh, he must be giving us a moment to escape. It's like, did they really need to explain that? I mean, it's like, I, I kind of preferred that they would have just kind of escaped. Like, you know, oh, you know, he's out there. Let's go. Something like that. Um, other things. Um, Matt, you also mentioned uh, the Finn and Rose plot line. I kind of also yeah. felt that it was a little bit weak at times. And uh, I mean, I kind of understand it too because they needed finn have to have something to do in the film otherwise what else yeah. is he gonna do so i mean i, I get that he was so useless <laughs> yeah and um uh yoda cgi at the very beginning when we first see him i thought was a little bit off and i kind of felt like the audience in the end uh, the auditorium we were in kind of maybe felt the same way they were kind of like what like it just looked really strange initially it got better after, as that scene progressed but initially when they first showed him like full you know, from the front, it, it was a little strange looking. And then, um, finally, last issue I had was uh, Phasma. I, I, I really felt that, you know, she was a little weak in the first film. I wanted to see more of her. Uh, in this film, I don't think she got any more or any less screen time than before. Right. She did get to do a little bit more, but she died way too quickly. And, you know, I think anybody that had issues with her in the first film are probably going to have similar issues to her this time around. She just died off too quickly. Real quick about Phasma before Steve starts. Um, uh, when when <laughs> when she died, I, I wanted to shout at the screen. Don't worry, she'll be back for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right? Yeah. All right, Steve. What do you think? Uh, to echo your comment, you guys' comments. You know, at the the casino scene uh, and the whole the whole sequence with Finn and Rose. I think I liked it from a visual standpoint, but in terms of the 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 story that it was trying to tell, it just went on for way too long. And what really wound me up is, I don't know whether you guys feel the same way about this, but I, it, it was rendered completely pointless um, by the time sort of Laura Dern's character ended up sacrificing herself. It was like, well, what was the point in that whole Yeah, she, Yeah. You know, it was like, well, okay, so you, it, it felt like filler, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I enjoyed it, but the film was way too long. 
um, in my, for me, I mean, I, you know, going into this, I was really excited that this was going to be the longest Star Wars film yet because I love Star Wars. I can't get enough of it. But sitting in the theatre and sitting through those scenes that were really dragged out, I thought, actually, you know what? This could have done with being a little bit shorter. And that scene in particular and that whole sequence in the casino and on Canto Bight and the whole, you know, freeing the Fathias and all that sort of stuff, that could have really been cut out. Yep. It wasn't really necessary. I mean, Ryan Johnson said it himself. There's a ton of deleted scenes from this film. That could have been maybe one of them. Um I think really that's the only thing I didn't like. I mean, like I said earlier on, that I loved the unpredictability of the film, um, and I loved the fact that they just sort of they they made everyone really get excited and start theorizing about Snoke and who he was and where he came from and all this sort of stuff, and then they just they just trolled the hell out of us by killing him off. Um, I liked that because it, I feel like it contributes to Ray and Kylo's story a lot more because it, ultimately the story is about them. And like a lot of people have already said, you, you know, we've got about as much information on Snoke as we did about Emperor Palpatine when Return of the Jedi came out. So in that respect, I don't have a problem with it that we don't know everything about him. But at the same time, I do, because now we've got a lot more context. We've got a lot more history when it comes to star wars you know we've got we, when the first three films came out we didn't know what had happened before them we had we didn't know what was going to happen after them whereas with this one you know before the 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 force awakens and last jedi era you'd got the sort of the galactic civil war and the rule of emperor palpatine and and snoke being as old as he is you you've got to imagine that he was around during emperor palpatine's reign and the problem i have is not so much the fact that his character wasn't fleshed out because it's not important, but what annoys me is the fact that no, nothing was really... There was no closure with his character. He was just sort of there, but he was powerful and he was there. And it's like, well, if this guy is also powerful, one, how did he get killed off so easily? And two, what the hell was he doing while Emperor Palpatine yes. was in power? Because would Emperor Palpatine really have sat back and just, you know, because you've got to believe that Palpatine would have known that this guy was was out there, and I can't, I find it difficult to 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 imagine that Snoke was just sitting on the sidelines, letting Emperor Palpatine do his thing when he's got his own goals and he's got his unless he knew that you know that the original trilogy was going to pan out the way it did. I don't understand how Snoke could have just been sat off in the background not doing anything while the original three films are going off and I would have liked to have known a little bit more about that. But at the same time, that's probably not the story that was supposed to be told in this film. But that's another thing that irritates me is the fact that now we're probably going to get comic books and novels and all that sort of stuff that flesh out the story. And like you said earlier, Matthew, I don't read, I don't tend to read a lot of the books and, and the novels and the comic books and all that sort of stuff. So it's the same issue I had with the prequels where to me, sort of Palpatine's um, whole conspiracy wasn't fleshed out properly in the prequels, I, I don't think. It was, for for the casual moviegoer, it was really confusing. And I feel like Snoke is like the, the Palpatine backstory and the Palpatine conspiracy plan of the prequels, that it's not being fleshed out enough for the casual cinema goer. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so... That 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 kind of irritated me a little bit, but on, generally speaking, you know what I saw on screen, I loved. It was just the the length, um, some of the dragged out bits. I mean, I, I did kind of sit there during the the layer scene and think, well, what the hell's going on? Um, but again, that's it's sort of a double edged sword because as soon as Leia got blasted out of the ship, I turned to my fiance and I said, look, she deserved better than that because I thought that was it. I thought that was where Leia was getting killed off, and I said, no, Leia deserved a bit better than that. To be written out of this film, she deserved way better. And I thought when they just started zooming in on her body floating through space, I thought that was just sort of a just wrapping that scene up. And then when she came came alive, I was like, "What? Wow! Thank God she's not dead yet." And then they didn't kill her off, and I was like, "Huh?" And I did, yeah. I, I'm not I'm not I'm not going to say that I didn't like that because that sounds really bad. But it again, the, the, as much as I love the unpredictability and the unexpected nature of the film, it, it did have its its drawbacks, and it's just I don't know. It's one of those things. It's, it's one of those things that's going to be debated and talked about for years to come, I think. And it's 
it's tough to find things that you like and things that you don't like from it without just sitting there and driving yourself mad. Uh-huh. So, well, I want to add on to that because you made a lot of great points. Um, I'm gonna go back to the beginning, uh, the casino stuff. You know, why didn't like Laura Dern's character? She did it like cool, like through light speed, sacrificed herself, and like cut through everything, which was like the most coolest thing besides seeing the force communication. But like, why didn't she do that earlier? Like you said about the being a time waster and stuff. Like Poe and Finn, like they were so, in my opinion, so useless compared to the first film, which I loved them in. And in this film, it's just like they're they're kind of just filler. It's just like okay, well, why don't you just do the, like the little uh, light speed slicing and then have the pods go off? Like that would have saved like 30, 40 minutes. I don't know, like. There's um, another point you're talking about Snoke. Um, I, okay, I can understand a counter argument here, but my thing is, if Snoke's like, "Yes, I can see inside your mind," yes, kill Ray, and then he doesn't see like Kylo see, like, manipulating the lightsaber to, yeah. to move, but I can understand the um, argument, the counter argument that well, maybe Kylo is more powerful than Snoke. But to that argument, I say via inference, if Snoke is more powerful than Rey, and because Rey submitted to her all the information via, you know, reading her mind, like easily. And if Kylo's more powerful than Snoke, then Kylo should have, when they went for the hero saber, Kylo should have won that battle rather than it splitting in two and them being equals. So I I don't think that Kylo was more powerful than Snoke, but I don't know who the hell knows. But um, you're saying oh Leia, so we can talk about Leia if you want to. But I heard they're not going to CGI her, and I was expecting her to to pass away in this one somehow. I don't know. Yeah, me too. But um, I heard they're not going to do a CG like they did the CG for Tarkin and Leia for Rogue One, um, and I'm like okay then. You have to recast her. And I was like, no, you can't recast her. I was like, well, how are you going to finish her story? Like, there's there's no way. Like, when she got blown away, I thought that was actually a really great way to go out. Because Kyle's like, Kyle's about to do it. He's like, you know what? I killed my dad. I'm not going to kill my mom. And he pulls away, but the TIE Fighters do it. I was like, damn, that's going to be, a, that's actually really cool. Because that could mess his mind up. Like, yeah, yeah. He, like he can be, he, he's already conflicted as it is. He's going to be even more conflicted now. And now he'll even hate, and it gives him more motivation to hate the First Order and start his own, what he wants to do. So that would have made a lot of sense. But... Uh, I, yeah, just, just a quick rant. I want to know, like, your thoughts of, like, what the hell they could do for Leia now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was on, I was exactly the same train of thought as you with, with the whole, how are they going to wrap up her story? Because if they, if they allude to the fact that she dies off screen in, in episode nine, that's just going to be like, really? We actually you know? talked about that. Yeah, we're like, yeah, at the crawl for episode nine does, Princess yeah, Leia, Leia is dead. Like, what? Yeah. There's a yeah, funeral I'm, I'm, for scene one, like, ugh. Yeah, I'm not going to be a fan of that. I'm not going to be a fan of that at all. If it, if it's just alluded to that she's there, but she's in the background, because the whole thing, the whole feeling right. that I got from from Last Jedi was that ultimately, Le- we, obviously with the death of Admiral Holdo, that Leia would end up passing leadership. Because I mean, she, I mean, not in in so much as Carrie Fisher looked this way, but Princess Leia in this film, and I think this was done intentionally. She looked frail, and she looked, she looked a little bit defeated after Han, you know, after Han's death. She wasn't, she was like in in Force Awakens, she was really, yeah, we can do it, sort of thing. And then in this, she was a bit more reserved and a little bit, um, I don't know the the right the right term to use. A bit just she, yeah, just a little bit more reserved. And she, I just she wasn't as ho- funky as she usually is. You know, yeah, she's a very exactly. strong character. She's one of the strongest female characters ever. So yeah, yeah. Um, and the whole feeling that I got and the whole the, the interpretation that I took away from this was that she would ultimately hand leadership of the resistance over to Poe. Right. And that's and that's the way I see it going in episode nine, because I think that's what that whole story art with Poe was trying to get at, that, you know, ultimately he's learning from his mistakes and Leia and Holdo are putting him in his place and making him realize that, you know, acting on impulse isn't the best way of doing things and all that sort of thing. And I think that whole end sequence with the the resistance on crate was, you know, it was alluding to Poe 
ultimately becoming leader of the resistance when Leia takes a step back. But how are they going to... I think that's probably the way that it's going to go. I think Poe's going to become General Poe in Episode Nine. But how that comes about with Leia, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't like to speculate, to be honest, because I, I, I don't think they'd kill her off off screen. I don't think they'd do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, and we know that she's not going to be in it because of what uh, Luke, the statement that Lucasfilm put out after Carrie Fisher passed away. So I don't know. It's, it's a, out of the many things going into Episode Nine, that's probably one of the toughest things to call, actually. Yeah, yeah, it, it'll be really interesting to see how they handle that and what they end up doing with that because that's a really tough one. I mean, I kind of feel like they kept the entire film the way they originally planned before she passed. Mm. So, yeah, it'll, it'll be really interesting. Um, one thing I want to touch on, and you guys uh, talked about this a little bit, was um, Kylo possibly being more powerful than Snoke. I don't think that he is. I kind of feel like this was a situation of what we saw in Return of the Jedi, where Luke tells the Emperor, well, your overconfidence is your weakness. I think yeah. it's the same exact thing. I think that... Uh, he was too overconfident. Kylo took advantage of that, and ultimately he outsmarted him. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, same same thing like with Vader. Uh, obviously, the Emperor didn't really see that coming because he was you know too enveloped in what was going on with Luke, and uh, Vader you know took him out as well. So the Master being killed by the Apprentice ultimately. I, I kind of like that little mirroring right there. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so Justin. So things about The Last Jedi that you weren't particularly fond of, didn't really like a whole lot, weaknesses, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, For me, maybe just a, a slight feeling of disappointment. Like I said before, I went in this movie completely blindly with no expectations of anything. I mean, I didn't care if anything happened, really. I just wanted to watch the movie. Um, but, one, but one thing that did pull me in a little bit was the whole connection that Kylo Ren and Rey had whenever she was, I guess, using the Force to communicate with him together. And it, it really started kind of developing to me like there's going to be some kind of a connection there, maybe something more beyond what actually happened in the fight scene, but, which I previously had said I enjoyed. Um, and, you know, I thought that was going to, like, solidify some kind of a bond with them. And then, you know, of course, that didn't end up happening. So for me, just a little little bit of this disappointment with that. I mean, I, I know, you know, I know the people that wrote the story wanted to go that go that way, and that's fine. But uh, that's, that's me. All right, so... Moving on to things that absolutely shocked us about The Last Jedi, things that were totally out of left field or that we didn't expect. So, Matt, let's go to begin with you. Well, okay, I'll preface this by saying some a-hole on my How to Talk Like Kylo Ren video, the day of Thursday, because every morning I check my social media, my email, YouTube comments, because I like to respond to, you know, the people... Some a-hole named... I'm not not even going to name his name. Some a-hole posts... In a, a comment, Kylo kills Snoke. I'm like, wow, thanks a lot, a hole. Like, oh my god, I was so pissed. And uh, I watched the film, and I was like, it's it, okay. So how's he gonna do? Is, is he gonna jump across the room? Is he gonna, is he gonna stab him? Like, oh, the lightsaber is turning. Okay, that works. It, it would have been so much better, and I think that would have been my answer if I didn't know that spoiler. Um, I think if my my true answer for you though is the way that uh Luke went out, he like sacrificed himself by using the force energy to project himself somehow, which I, I don't like, I, w- I wish he was physically there, but um, I think that was the biggest surprise for me that he was like a, a essentially like a hologram and he wasn't actually like fighting Kyle. He kind of just like trolled Kyle. That's like the thing, like this whole movie is just a troll. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's all of this it's like hey fans you think snoke's emperor palpatine well screw you he's not he's a nobody you want you want ray's parents to be obi-wan or luke's uh, <laughs> daughter screw you you want a real awesome fight to to finish the arc between kylo and luke nah we're not gonna give you that <laughs> like oh it was but that's probably my answer that's probably my biggest surprise nice and uh steve what do you think most shocking things about last jedi um like, like Matt said, I think Snoke going out as quickly as he did, wasn't expecting that, didn't see it coming. Um, it's not something I love, it's not something I hate, but it was definitely unexpected. It came as a massive shock, and it was probably the... I don't know, there were a ton of moments in this film where I was left, like, you know, I, I was, my mouth was catching flies throughout, you know. Um, I think Leia not being killed off. Shock. Leia, uh, uh, this is the thing, I think for me, I was shocked, and then shocked again straight after so many times throughout this film like when Leia got blasted out of the ship 
and into space. I, I was shocked because I didn't see that being the way that they'd kill her off. And then when she wasn't dead and floated back to the ship, I was shocked again because I didn't expect her to live. And then when Snoke died, I was shocked. And when and and when that happened, I was sat there thinking, right, this is it. It's oh, did I? No, wait, hang on. I'm trying to think about this chronologically and what what happened first. Um, no, it was so so uh, so. Rain, Kylo, and Snoke are all in the throne room. Yeah, and. Snoke and Kylo is uh, talking to Ray, and at that point, I thought, "Right, this is it. This is Ray turning." And then, right, and then Snoke gets killed, and then I'm like, "Ah, now what's going to happen?" And then, uh, oh god, I'm trying to, I'm trying to. I've only seen the film once, so I'm just trying to replay it all in my head <laughs> again. Um, yeah, and then Kylo gave Ray the speech, and I thought, "Ah, Ray's going to turn, and it's going to be Ray and Kylo taking on Luke." And then, and then I was shocked. And then Ray rejected Kylo, and then I was shocked. It was just, it was constant, like, it was just, I was shocked all the time throughout this film. And then, like you said, Matt, um, the way Luke went out at the end, the fact that he wasn't there shocked me. And then the fact that he died shocked me, because I honestly didn't think that Luke was going to die. Um, maybe in episode nine. I thought I thought he would for sure for this one. I just felt like if you kill Han for episode seven, yeah, you're, you're going to have to kill... Luke Kylo's gonna have to physically kill Luke in eight so that you as a writer so for episode nine Kylo is like this freaking unstoppable monster that our hero has to face off against it is almost like she can't win but somehow she can outsmart him and she does like that's like, yeah. like that's your three x structure or like trilogy type film like I I, I knew he had to be cut down by i thought he's gonna maybe obi-wan himself which he kind of did but like yeah. I, I knew i knew i had i had a real gut feeling that that we had to have luke die if, if we want to set up a really great villain we can't just have this as a filler movie we have to have something significant happen like in the first film so i really did feel like uh luke was gonna go out but not the way he went out but um i don't i don't want to cut you off but i do want to um talk to justin and i wanted to say real quickly the the whole force communication was building up the story so that Kylo, he wants to be like the king and he wants Rey to be his queen. So oh. like that's cause so going back to Steve, so that like that's when like he's trying to turn her and stuff. That's his whole like motivation and his whole plot is just like he wants to be the emperor, you know, and he wants her by his side. Like he really like likes her. Hmm. Maybe likes her, likes her, but like that's like he he wants to have these two powerful forces controlling everything. That's what he really wanted. Uh, okay, I see. All right, so Justin, um, uh -huh. anything about the film that you thought was unexpected or shocking? Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, sorry, but no comment on that. No, not really. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Um, so for me, uh, let's see. Uh, you guys talked about Snoke's death. I totally did not see that coming. I did not expect it. Um. Uh, Matt, it's really too bad that somebody ruined that for you. Cause, I know. Yeah, that, that's it's. I had something like that happen with the Force Awakens with Han Solo being killed. I mean, I, oh, that there, sucks. Yeah, so I, I kind of knew it was going to happen, but I thought it was still very emotional for me either way. It was still a big deal. Oh yeah, but, it's the best scene for sure. I, I oh, still uh, yeah. play it in my mind. Bad, bad, bad. Every time I still watch that watch that film, I still get kind of teary eyed about that. Um, but yeah, that was that was totally out of left field for me. I didn't think that he was going to die i thought you know he's going to at least last through the end of this trilogy and then ray's going to kill him somehow totally didn't happen that way um so justin mentioned uh luke drinking br the breast milk from that creature i was like shocked when i saw that like i did not think i was going to see something like that in a star wars film it was just so random and so weird <laughs> but right. i mean i guess i guess in a good way possibly but the first time you see that it's very <laughs> jarring for sure uh -huh. um, Luke's death. I didn't think he was going to die. Uh, I didn't think Leia was going to die. So that wasn't really for me, not a big deal, but Luke, I didn't see that coming at all. I mean, when he died, it wasn't, I didn't get emotional the way I did when Han died for some reason. Mm. To me, it was kind of more of a fitting kind of death. Like it made sense from the standpoint yeah. that, you know, he's joining the, he rejoined the fight. He's saving the heroes and he's going out like that, which, you know, that fits Luke's character perfectly. But, um, just the fact that, you know, he wasn't even really physically there was a little bit, you know, kind of not saying I really expected to see, but he has that power. So that was kind of 
uh, very interesting to see that, you know, he's, even though he's been in exile all this time, obviously he's been practicing some, a few things here and there. Um, and uh, the other thing, the fact that the force ghosts are so powerful, we saw Yoda, you know, be able to conjure up this lightning out of nowhere and, you know, burn the tree down. Um, to, I've always wondered when Obi-Wan said, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can ever imagine. He said that to Darth Vader in A New Hope. And uh, see, actually seeing how that's possibly true with Yoda being able to do that, you know, kind of answers that question for me. So we kind of mm -hmm. know now that force ghosts actually can do that sort of thing. And then uh, that kind of makes me wonder if Luke was able to do that astral projection or whatever you want to call it that he did when he was alive. Um, imagine what he'll be able to do in episode nine as a force ghost. I mean, it, it just kind of increases the possibilities of how powerful he can actually become. Yeah, true. So now I'd like to address some lingering questions that I have. And perhaps you guys might have these same questions. Maybe you can help me figure out some of these things. Um, overall, I felt like this film... Uh, that it had, a, I left the theater with less questions than I did with The Force Awakens because there were a lot of things about it that to me didn't make sense. Um, uh, for example, things about Starkiller Base, like if it drained the energy from, from the sun, why didn't everybody just like instantly freeze <laughs> when it was gone? <laughs> um, you know, how was everybody able to see, you know, what happened uh, to the New Republic, you know, when it got taken out by Starkiller Base, you know, all across the galaxy, you know, just little things like that, that, you know, maybe more science based, but didn't really, really make a whole lot of sense. Um, in any case, there are a few things that I did leave the theater wondering about. So first one, did Snoke really die? What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. That's something that I wanted to touch base on, actually. Sorry to jump in. Um, but the, I, I actually think I, I think he is going to end up ultimately being dead. Um, because like Matt said earlier on, I think that was the, the troll in the film. That, haha, you had all these theories about Snoke, but nope. Um, but at the same time, it would not surprise because one of the thing, the, the, one of the things that I didn't think about right away, but after processing all the information and everything that I'd seen in the film, uh, uh, you know, a couple of days afterwards, the one thing that I thought was, Snook admitted that he was the one who was putting Kylo and Ray together telepathically. How did they carry on doing it after Snook was dead? Uh huh. You know, I, I think right. maybe, maybe they, maybe he, maybe Snoke just opened the door and and you know, like it was like teaching him how to ride a bike. You know, they let him, he 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 allowed them to do it, and then after doing it, they they knew how. But that was one of the things that I thought. I thought, how if it's Snoke doing that, how did they carry on doing it afterwards? And a lot of people are throwing it out there now that in the Force Awakens, that it's maybe Snoke. Um, making Vader speak to to Kylo, so mm -hmm. that whole tele tel telepathy thing, I think, is going to be crucial to whether or not Snoke is actually dead. I think he will be, um, just because. But it wouldn't surprise me if, come Episode Nine, he's actually because I've heard a few, I've read a few articles, and I've read, uh, not not so much rumors and and theories and such, but. I think it was an interview with Andy Serkis where Andy said he that Snoke never shows his true form to anyone. So is that he was that even Snoke sitting in that chair? Was that his? You know, are we going to see some sort of expanded universe, Dark Empire shtick where Snoke can move into different bodies? Do you know, does that make sense? Yeah, possesses them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen and that 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 crinkly old man that was sat in that throne isn't actually snoke that wouldn't surprise me at all that would be really interesting to do because they already introduced like telepathic like force communication but uh i don't know like i don't know if you can take like interviews on like the red carpet or wherever they're at when they're talking for granted because like uh ryan johnson said that uh from what i've heard um that luke and leia don't have a scene together in last jedi and what happened they did so it's like they're they're, they're kind of like safeguarding and maybe they'll throw you some like uh you know magic to uh d distract you and i maybe it, so going back to the snoke stuff um i felt like ray and kylo like when they did that together for the first time the telepathic communication 
I felt like they knew how to do it, but maybe Snoke was, because he's powerful too, he just listens in and maybe he just manipulated it. So I don't necessarily think that he was the one that like started it. And that's necessarily means that he's still alive because they could still do it. Like I, I'm a firm believer in that dude is dead. Like he got cut <laughs> in half. Like So did Darth Maul. Is Darth, Darth Maul still alive, people? No, he's not. He's long gone, sadly. He was one of the coolest looking, one of my favorite characters He's gone. I'm sorry to say this. Like, he's dead. <laughs> so, I think Snoke is long. <laughs> Snoke may return. I think this, if they had to do it somehow, the possession thing would be pretty cool. But uh, if Snoke had to return somehow, I think he'll return like Luke will, like as a Force ghost. So, um, but before I end uh, my little segment here, I want to say something about the Yoda puppet. I really like the Yoda puppet. Um, they kind of threw like a blue aura around or whatever, a CG, but I think he was a puppet. I really enjoyed him. Well, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Uh, so the reason I ask about Snoke is that we saw Luke at the very end. Uh, you know, a lot of people assumed he was actually there on crate encountering Kylo Ren. There were a few clues mm-hmm. that he wasn't. But what if Snoke was doing the same thing? What if he was maybe somewhere off projecting himself, even though he got cut in half? Uh, what, what if there's some other element to this nah. kind of force power that caused him to not really be there because <laughs> he was physically cut in half like when you watch my friend made a good point my friend chris um when you watch the fight and they even show it like ryan did a great job of like kind of alluding it to you for you the audience when kylo and luke are having their lightsaber battle when luke uh like slides it looks like he's floating and you know because the salt on the planet turns red when you like move mm-hmm. or, or you know, scrape against it when Kylo shuffles, you can see the red, and they'll sh- even show his feet. Like it's a purposeful design choice. Like, they'll show his feet, and his feet move, and there's there's red marks. But like when Luke moves, there's nothing there. And so, of course, what happens? So when Kylo lunges at Luke to take that huge strike, and it goes right through him, he's like, "What the hell?" So when the hero saber goes through Snoke, Snoke gets cut in half, and he's physically there he's not you know projected there or a hologram or anything so like snoke is gone like he's dead (laughs) (laughs) all right i'll accept that well the reason here's another thing that kind of ties into this a little bit and it goes it goes back to that same confrontation with luke and kylo ren so uh we've been talking about uh ray and kylo ren being able to connect through the force there's a moment where luke sees them connected and he's like you know wait stop and they both turn and they look right at him so at that moment, I'm assuming that Kylo saw Luke. And if he did, he would have seen that Luke is the older uh, guy, you know, longer hair, more gray in the beard than he actually encountered on Crate. And we know mm-hmm. that he looked a lot younger on Crate because that's right. how he last looked when Kylo Ren saw him. But if, if Kylo actually saw him during that brief moment uh, when he was connecting with Rey, how did that not clue him in to uh, the fact that Luke may not have actually been there? Yeah. Okay. okay. I I can I can say some. Um, I feel that he like just like trimmed himself up and made himself look presentable. Slash the same way he remembers him when he had his little school and when he's about to kill him, but then he showed remorse and backed away. I felt like, and that was perfect for their arc. Like this is the moment where they split up, and then here they are again, and he's he's he looks the same again. So that's my uh. So, go ahead, Steve. That was that was my initial thought as well. That you know, because you, you, you when Ray and Kylo were connecting through the Force, and obviously Kylo sees Luke and realizes that Ray's with him. Um, as soon as he came, as soon as Luke came out on crate, I was like, wait. Before I, this is before I realized that he wasn't actually there. I was like, when did Luke get time to dye his beard? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I was like that, that. So that you know, I, I, alarm bells went off as soon as I saw that. But I, you know, it's one of those things that you don't really process. Like you say, I, I just thought that oh, he's trimmed himself up and made himself look presentable before he came out. But it did, it did throw a little thing out there. I was like, what? See, <laughs> you know, the, the galaxy's in jeopardy. But wait, let me just die, cut my hair and, and dye my beard. They got some like um, animals there that have like just for men on Ek Two or whatever the, the <laughs> island is called. <laughs> got the caretakers um, to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I actually, I felt that entire scene that Luke wasn't really there, and it was all based on his appearance, like the way that he looked. I, I to me that like totally clued me in. And then, like you guys said, the fact that he wasn't kicking up the salt. I mean, I noticed that. I noticed the lightsaber. It's like that was to me like a huge giveaway. Like how could he have? 
rebuilt that lightsaber, you know, that quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, which that was a little nitpick for me, actually, is like, why didn't he have the green lightsaber in that moment? To me, that would have been perfect. It, they didn't go yeah. that route for whatever reason. So it was kind of a bummer. But Probably that just it kind of spoiled the ending too much, maybe for him. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. I mean, to me, that kind of just kind of augments that maybe Kylo isn't the most as brilliant maybe as he thinks. <laughs> because if you have him, if you have Luke with the green saber, you're going to think, well, as a fan, because you've seen Jedi and stuff return, um, that like, oh, he's going to die right now because he's got the green. Because when he had the green in the third film, uh, Return, uh, he it was over. That was the end of that story. So like now you're thinking if he's got the green one in Last Jedi, he's fighting uh, Kylo. And this is only the second movie. He's probably going to croak. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I just kind of felt like it was kind of kind of a necessary thing. That's one of the few things like that. If I absolutely had the power to change, I would I would definitely change that. Um, not not necessarily for fan service per se, but uh, just because it, it seemed to me it would have been more fitting. And again, goes back to Kylo Ren. Like, how did he not notice? You know, those, those types of things. Yeah. Um, next question that I have: When we start out the film, they make it kind of clear that Luke is the last Jedi, and you know, the opening crawl from Force Awakens even says as much. By the end of the film, and not not counting what happens in Episode Nine or in the future, uh, do you guys think that Rey is the last Jedi? I don't think Rey is the last Jedi because of what we get at the end, at the very, very, very end of the film. I think because uh, I mean, th- this is another thing where I think multiple viewings will will benefit a lot of people because I th- that was one thing I missed at the end with the with the little boy looking off into the stars. I didn't notice it when I when I saw the film. I didn't notice him pick up the broom with the force, but then as soon as I'm, you know, I jump on Twitter and I'm reading all the comments from other people who've seen it, I'm seeing people saying, "Oh, the little boy picks up the broom with the force." I'm like, "Did he? What? When? How?" Yeah, he did. Because yeah. I thought that I thought that was just alluding to a next the next generation of, of rebels and the resistance. I didn't think it was alluding. I know now I think it's alluding to both, but. I didn't think it was alluding to a new generation of Jedi because I missed that little detail. Yeah. But now, now that I know that, and now that I'll know to look out for it when I go and see it again, I think that we're going to get. I mean, it's it's basically a, a I'll not say a repeat, but you, you've got to imagine that there's never going to like like Luke says, there's never going to be a last Jedi because there was never a last Jedi sort of throughout the Clone Wars era and all that sort of thing. There was, you know, people are just force sensitive and it do- and it doesn't matter like you were saying earlier matt that that ray being a nobody is not particularly the best way to go about it but i think it is because it's not i don't think having the having the force and being force sensitive and having the potential to become a jedi is necessarily something that needs to be passed down through familial ties or anything like that it's something that you know if, if you've got it you've got it and i think like with that child at the end yeah I found it a little bit bit like not yeah. obviously not seeing it straight away watching the film but after reading what people had said about it after and people pointing it out to me that this little boy picks up the broom with the force the first thing that I thought was how does he know how to use it but at the same time you've got to think well if you've got these powers you're going to maybe use them by accident at some point yeah so you know I, but I think that I, I don't think Ray I think what they were trying to allude to with this film is that Ray is going to be the next Luke. She's going to be the next teacher because she's, you know, she takes the Jedi texts with her from from actor and they're in the mm-hmm. and they're on the Falcon and stuff, which is again something that I missed watching it the first time. But I think yeah, that, I missed that too. Yeah, that's what too. they're trying to get at is that Ray is going to be the the one that goes off to teach this new generation of Jedi, and I think that's probably what we're going to see at the end of of Episode Nine. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that. I think that in the context of this film, again, not counting episode nine, that Rey is the last Jedi, but they do give us that uh, image that, you know, there are going to be other Jedi, that she's not going to necessarily be the last one beyond this film. And uh, I like also your line of thinking that, you know, anybody could be have the Force or, you know, maybe not maybe not anybody could have the Force, but maybe you don't have to be come from a specific lineage in order to be Force sensitive. And yeah. I think the film did a really good job of highlighting that and making a point of that. So I really love the way that it ended. Um, so in, in the movie, um, one thing I really liked is that uh, Luke mentions Darth Sidious, uh, allusion to the prequels. And uh, he also uh, references it in the sense that 
I think, and I, I'd like to see what you guys think, but he says something along the lines of a Jedi found Anakin Skywalker and that was a failure because he went on to become Darth Vader. Was he referring to Qui-Gon Jinn? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I have to see it twice for sure. Yeah. Because I, I missed the Jedi text with, like, Ray took him. I totally missed that too, so. Yeah, I think, again, it's something that you're going to have to think about after a second viewing. Like, yeah. the, like real quickly, like the kid with the broom, like, Ryan, I think, did that on purpose. He like filmed it as like a wide shot when the kid moved the broom. It's like so quick. I was like, wait, did he just move the broom with this like without touching with his hand? <laughs> like, is this force sensitive little child? And then it ends. I'm like, oh, okay, that's that makes sense then. So like, yeah, th- my friends were like, yeah, he moved the broom. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like some people were like, wait, what happened? So it, it definitely needs like a second viewing. Right on. Yeah, I kind of feel the same. I think that I was so taken with his mention of Darth Sidious that I kind of like lost a little bit of what he said right after that. Yeah. <laughs> so on uh, my next viewing, I'll definitely pay more attention there. Um, so next thing, uh, is Kylo Ren still redeemable? So we saw glimpses of the possibility in The Last Jedi, but ultimately he sees the opportunity to remain dark. He made the decision to take control of the First Order. Is there any chance at this point that he is still redeemable? I hope not because we've seen it um I, I after seeing the film I, I i i thought well while i was watching the film i thought oh it's okay he's gonna he's you know ray's gonna be able to ultimately persuade him to I, I, as soon as he killed snoke i thought that was it i thought he was redeemed i thought ray sees something in him ray sees that it's not all it's it's not all it's cracked up to be and that he, he is ultimately going to turn but then the minute that after Snoke had died and the dust had cleared in the throne room and, and Kylo was basically like, look, we're more powerful than Snoke. We can set up a new order and we can take over and rule the galaxy. I thought, no, he's he's gone. That was when, that's when, to me, part of that conflict within him disappeared because he's starting to now... I think originally he, was, he wasn't necessarily conflicted by the dark and the light, he was conflicted by whether or not he held all this disdain for his parents. And a lot of the reasons why he maybe was seduced by Snoke was because of these, the resentment that he had towards Han and Leia. Um, but after that, I think he probably real. I think he made that decision consciously to be dark and to embrace the, the darker side of the force, like with the whole... It, it was essential to me. It was. I, I don't know if either of you guys have seen it, but the episode three video game um, that was released years ago. Oh yeah. There was an alter. There was an alternate ending to that. Yes. Where, where Anakin ends up killing Obi Wan, and then the Emperor arrives on Mustafar, and he, you know, he's well done, my apprentice. And then ultimately, Anakin turns and kills the Emperor, and says the galaxy belongs to him and that's what i got from that scene was that right. this is this is this totally. is basically this is basically kylo ren having that having that choice and instead of going the way that anakin goes or, or well obviously not that anakin goes because he, he did make that decision in the end but obviously not as consciously um to me it was sort of like it, it, it was essentially kylo ren saying no nah, do you know what actually I know what I want to be. I know who I am now. That was him finding himself, and I think that was solidified to me when Hook started calling him Supreme Leader, and he didn't flinch. He's not like, you know, it was... I think it's it's a case of Kylo cementing his own destiny, and I think that that will ultimately be his downfall in Episode Nine. Um, I can't see it being a, a rinse and repeat of Vader where Ray continues to believe that there's light in him i still think that she does she does think there's still light in him because there was that little moment of hesitation when she's on the falcon and she looks at him and then she decides to shut the the ramp on the falcon that you, you can see it in her face that she's she's disappointed i think more than anything else that she wasn't able to to bring him back um but i don't think it's something that's that is going to happen i think he's going to continue to reject her and reject the light side and that's ultimately going to be his undoing in episode nine i don't think it's going to be the same case as with vader in in return uh-huh. of the jedi where he sees it he sees the light and because ultimately there's no one for there's no like with vader where you'd got you'd got luke trying to persuade vader to come back to the light you'd got the emperor there pulling the strings and putting these right. you know 
like putting the doubt in his mind. Whereas now Snoke's out. If Snoke is really out of the picture, Snoke's gone, and Kylo has made that decision himself to be the leader and to be the supreme leader and to be the. To, he's chosen to be the villain, which uh-huh. is something that Vader never really did. He Vader was more manipulated to do it and just did it. I, I'm going off on a tangent, but that I think that that is the going to be the way that it all turns out. I think that is Kylo Ren consciously making the the decision to be the villain and he, he, he doesn't necessarily see himself as being the villain because he's still and that's clear in his hatred for Luke because he still thinks that the Luke is the one that tried to kill him so but I think that is that he's he's chosen his own path and that's what's gonna that's where we're gonna head, find him in episode nine yeah I think I agree I think it's what's gonna happen is they're gonna play on the theme of selfishness and how Kylo wants like the whole galaxy for himself and you have to, you know, teach the kids watching that hey kids, don't be selfish, don't be like Kylo Ren and so they're going to have to kill off Kylo and you know there's a reason why people are good people are good and evil people are evil. So like that's falls into the evil spectrum. So I agree 100% where episode 9 is going to be. Awesome guys. Justin, any thoughts about that? Um, you know, it really seemed convincing to me that he could be redeemable. I think uh yeah, I mean, I think there's a good side to him. Uh, just for for whatever reason, the uh, the dark side keeps pulling him just just a little bit too strong. <laughs> All right. So, one thing I want to touch on uh, as we wrap up here is the music. Uh, any thoughts on the uh, soundtrack compared to the Force Awakens, and just in the overall context of the saga? So, Matt, let's start with you. Um, you know, I, I my, my one friend Chris I went with, he's like, oh my god, the soundtrack was amazing, it was better than Force Awakens. Here, I, I think I was so, like, zoned in and focused on the story that I kind of, like, forgot about the soundtrack itself, so, I mean, I thought it was okay. I'm, I'm maybe not the best person to, on first viewing to, to talk about that, so. I, the only thing I remember soundtrack-wise from Force Awakens in this film was just Ray's theme from <laughs> Force Awakens, so... I'll pass it on to Steve. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you. I was I was too busy concentrating on the the story and the dialogue to really take a lot of notice of the the soundtrack. I obviously noticed all the key themes from Force Awakens, like Kylo's theme, the First Order theme, Rey's theme, the Resistance theme, which is I think one of my new favorite themes from Star Wars. Now, I absolutely love that. Uh, loved it in the Force Awakens. Loved it here as well. Um, I did notice the uh, elements of the Imperial March for w- during some of Snoke scenes, um, which I, I'll not say shocked me, but I thought it. I don't know. I, I didn't. I didn't hate it, but I didn't like it because to me the Imperial March is Vader's theme, uh, just like Kylo Ren in the First Order's theme is is Kylo Ren's theme. Um, so to hear it played for Snoke was a little bit strange. Um, it was a nice nod, but I think in relation to the characters, it didn't fit. And I don't know, there was just, uh, apart from the the reused tracks from Force Awakens, I didn't find the soundtrack to Last Jedi particularly memorable. But then again, I haven't listened to it on its own yet. So once I've listened to the soundtrack, I'll probably think, oh, yeah, this is this is pretty good. And, and I will begin to, I mean, for me, Rogue One, and Force Awakens have got really good soundtracks. I didn't think it the first time I saw them, but upon multiple viewings, you know, there are there are a lot of themes within both of those movies that really stand out to me, like Krennic's theme in Rogue One, as I said, Kylo and the Resistance's theme in, in Force Awakens. And I think after seeing Last Jedi a few more times, it'll be the same case, but upon first viewing, nothing really stood out to me other than the, the, uh, the themes that I've mentioned. Right on. So yeah, I personally I have a hard time kind of saying if it's better than The Force Awakens or you know about on par with it. Uh, I'm kind of inclined to think maybe it's a little bit better, but l- like you said, Steve, it does borrow a lot from The Force Awakens, obviously as it should. This is a different trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hear Rey's theme, we hear Kylo Ren's theme, and uh, we hear the Resistance theme quite a bit. So I mean, I, I'm appreciative that they have those in there. Um, as far as whether or not it, it built on that, uh, it's kind of hard to say. There is kind of a theme that I you do hear recurring a little bit. And I actually did get the last Jedi soundtrack and I played through it once so far. And I do hear this theme, in, at least in the soundtrack, quite a bit. And I don't remember it in the film so much. I'm going to need to rewatch. I am seeing it again tomorrow. So I'll, I'll pay, pay Kyle, special attention Kyle's for theme? that. No, no, it's, it's a different theme specifically for the last Jedi. It's like a recurring oh. bit. And you hear it in the end credits and... 
it, in the soundtrack, it, it recurs quite a bit. And I didn't really notice it too much in the film. So I'm going to pay attention to that tomorrow. But um, it's a little bit different. It does remind me more of the original trilogy. Um, and uh, it actually is a little bit Jaws-like, <laughs> if you guys can believe that. <laughs> but um, I'll see if I can find a link to, to it, Matt. And maybe if you want to take a look at that and see what you think. Oh, yeah, because sure. I know, you know, you and I are both huge Jaws fans. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, overall, I, I can't really say yet. I need to see the film again uh, to say what this, the soundtrack, what I really feel about it. But one thing mm-hmm. I did like, and I know Justin really likes this a lot, is uh, the Canto Bite Casino music. So yeah. Justin, I'll let you touch on that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it was cool. It sound, kind of sounded like, uh, you know, I like the whole steel drums thing. It sounded to me a lot like the Cantina song, although it's not. Um, and luckily, Victoria bought the soundtrack to the movie already, so we got to listen to that yesterday in our nice uh, stereo in the living room. <laughs> yeah, we really like. I don't know. That's probably my favorite track on the soundtrack too. I just love the way they did it. <laughs> Your stereo is awesome. awesome too, which helps. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, last thing, I mentioned that I couldn't yet do this. It, I still need to see the film, you know, many more times before I can really solidify where I place it. But do you guys at this point? have any idea of where you would rank its position in this terms of the entire series? Hmm. I, I don't yet. Um, I want to put it near the top because I feel, uh, I don't, I don't want to say that this is cause I, I didn't, I, w- I wasn't around when the original trilogy came out. Um, so to, for me, the prequels were what I grew up with. So I don't really want, I don't want to say that I, I want to put, Force Awakens and Last Jedi up near the top because it's so it, they're movies for my generation as such because I feel like these are the movies for the generation after me um, because I was the one that grew up with the with the prequels but I think in terms of story and character development and dialogue and all that sort of thing I think it's de- it's it's definitely higher on the list than it is lower it's definitely higher than a lot of the movies in in the Star Wars saga so far it's definitely up above. <laughs> all of the prequels not not that i'm a prequel hater because revenge of the sith is one of my favorite star wars movies but same um it's it's definitely up there above all of those um i can say i can safely say that just because of the 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 characters in these movies i'm so much more invested in than i was i think that's purely what it is i'm 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 invested in these characters in these new films and that's what puts it up near the top but like you said victoria it's going to take a lot more viewings and a lot more focus for me to really say whereabouts it is at the moment force awakens is sort of third or fourth on my on my list and i think last jedi at the minute comes underneath that just because i've only seen it once and there you know i don't know enough about it yet and i haven't taken as much in to cement it in a certain place but you know i'm, I'm going to see it in about i'm going to see it again in a in a week or so so uh once I've seen it again, I shall uh, probably have a more more clear idea. Right on. Matt, what about you? Okay, so we have to re-rank them, including the original trilogy? Well, yeah, if you're if you're able to or not. I'm not able to yet, but I, if you're I, able I, to. I can try. Yeah, I, I'm with Steven, and I want to like see it again before I want to rank them, but I can just give a rank right now for one viewing. Um, I'll go New Hope, Force Awakens, Empire, and this is where it gets funny. Um, I go Revenge Over Return. Because for some reason, I just really like Revenge. And I really like Return as a kid. But for some reason, like as an adult, after the first half hour, I'm like, eh, you know. Um, so I like Revenge over Return. But I want to, for right now, put Jedi Sandwich between them. Last Jedi. Um, if I see it twice, and, you know, the things I hate, maybe I'll grow to like them over time. And I only did see it one time, and, like, you have these expectations, like, damn it, that sucks. And then maybe for this next film, maybe Kylo lied to Rey. Maybe Rey does have some cool parents, you know? So uh, maybe in the next film, it'll kind of, like, help out what they set up. So for the time being, I have it sandwiched between Revenge and Return, but maybe after a second viewing or whatever I see for they do for Episode Nine, it'll bolt up past revenge and maybe even like past empire and stuff but who knows i don't know right on yeah um for me it's 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 really tough to say like kind of like well not exactly like steve but i was i was born after the original trilogy came out um but i do remember them much more than be than uh before the prequels came out because i was still a kid when 
uh, the prequels came out, and we were special edition kids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was I was already collecting like I started collecting like in ninety five, ninety six before the prequels even came out. I was old enough to collect like, but I was you know still growing up on the original trilogy, even though I wasn't around when it came out. Uh-huh. So uh, I was like in middle school, high school when the prequels started were were coming out, and uh, I do agree that over time your point of view kind of changes on where you might rank a movie. Like for example, when I was a kid. Um, I liked Attack of the Clones more than Phantom Menace. Today, I would say that I like Phantom Menace more than Attack of the Clones. So I, I think my ultimately it's going to change. I even go back and forth between Empire and uh, A New Hope. I, I know that A New Hope is usually my favorite, uh, but I still think Empire is the best. So um, as of right now, I can't really say where I would rank it, but I kind of feel like in terms of the overall series, it would be a little bit closer to the top. But I... I definitely don't think it would be at the top. It would just be a little closer mm-hmm. uh, in that respect. Um, Justin, any thoughts on that? Uh, you've seen all the films at least once. As What do you think as far as where this film ranks in terms of the overall Star Wars series? Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so hard for me to have an opinion on that. Um, you know, I, I, to be honest, I still get the order of the movies and actuality and then when they were actually made all mixed up so that sounds that sounds bad but um i mean i thought it was i thought it you know to me it seemed like a well-made movie um you know i understand you know disney's taking everything over now and it seems like they're holding up the quality and the, the story and, and all that so yeah yeah and that's that's actually a good thing that that that's why i wanted him on the show was because you know he he does come from a different um you know perspective that he has than, than most of us do because he he only watches these films because i do basically <laughs> he tolerates my collecting and passion for star wars so i think that really adds a lot to you know kind of more of an outsider point of view yeah for sure um but i do want to wrap this up with uh, any final thoughts that we might have on the film so uh, steve i'll go ahead and start with you um fine. generally speaking uh, i i really enjoyed it really really enjoyed it and it's i think like you said earlier, Victoria, you said that it left you with um, a lot less questions than you had coming out of Force Awakens. You had more questions coming out of that movie. For me, it's the opposite, because even though we didn't know about all these characters, I mean, it's, it's answered questions about characters, but in terms of the plot and the direction that the saga will ultimately end with, it's, it's just, it's thrown me off completely, because for me, Force Awakens opened up multiple doors as to what direction the 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 trilogy could go, and now for me, I feel as though it really narrows that down now. Uh, and where whereas at the end of Force Awakens we'd got maybe I don't know five, six, seven, ten different directions the 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 trilogy could go. Now I feel like we've got two with regards to an ultimate end game, whether or not you know. Kylo dies but remains evil, or whether Kylo dies but, but is redeemed, or or maybe three at a maximum. If Kylo lives and doesn't for for a maximum, I don't know. I don't know. It's just I, I'm I'm still trying to process everything and trying to. I'm, I I think f- for me, the problem I have every time I come out of a Star Wars film is I don't tend to focus on what has happened. I tend to focus on what's going to happen after, and that sometimes makes me miss out on a lot of the details of what I've just seen and I'm too busy thinking about what's going to come next and what's actually going on now so I think I just need to see the film again to really process everything and really think about what has happened rather than what is going to happen going forward if that makes any sense yeah absolutely absolutely Matt I'm with Steven. It's just like, yeah, like, oh, like I don't know because there is so much to process and like right now I sit at like a like a seven or a six, like maybe, like I said, over time I'll, I'll grow to like it and whatever they do with nine and maybe I'll appreciate it more, but this is like star Wars and I had so much expectations. And for rogue one, I had a lot of expectations and I bought so much crap, so many toys and all this stuff from rogue one. And I, and the movie ended, I'm like, huh? because <laughs> I loved Force Awakens so much and I was like alright yeah and I bought more stuff after the film I was hyping myself up so much for Rogue One that I was a little let down and then for this film I don't know if I was let down but 
and I don't know how to say I was disappointed, but there's like this consensus that people are like, they, they leave the theater kind of like, eh, or like, kind of like a, they don't have like a feeling to the film. Like maybe even the movie's not even like a Star Wars movie to them. So it's, it's, it's so tough to say something at these early stages, but, uh, Right now, I'm like with Steve. I'm like, yeah, I need to, I need to see it at least twice. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I don't know if I'll see it again in the theaters, but I'll definitely try to see it, buy it on like Blu-ray or rent it or something. But uh, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see how Episode Nine is, especially with JJ coming back because JJ did Seven and I love Seven. So I'm hoping I'm gonna really love Nine. So we'll see. Is he going to move the scar back on Kylo's face? <laughs> you know that's something that they did really cool we didn't really talk about that like he had that big ass scar and they had like the carbon fiber or something and then like he got it fixed within like one scene and it was done with the oh my god that is so funny with the little I think it was for Hux or for the first something for the first order like somebody had like a an iron like their iron it's like floating irons or force irons like and but the shot was like this epic like almost like a ship coming down and then it pans out or it cuts to like a wide of like ironing like the first order black clothes <laughs> so uh that's actually kind of cool that they they fixed up kyle scar like that but i don't think he's gonna move it back but i know i really love really like jj's episode seven so i'm really looking forward to jj's nine and see what he does right on so at this point you would say that you prefer you know having only seen it once you prefer currently episode seven over episode eight. Oh yeah see i've i've, I've seen people like say like oh i just barely i barely a, a smidge Review or place Force Awakens over Last Jedi. I'm like, oh, no, it's no contest for me. I, I love, I love, love Force Awakens compared to this film. And 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 I don't want to say it, but maybe this film like lacked a Han Solo. Like, I don't know. Like Chewie's there and he didn't do anything. He he tried to eat a porg. Like I don't know. Like this film lacked something. I don't know what it is right now, but maybe it's Han or something. I don't know. I I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I am glad that Leia got, that Chewie got her ear, he, the hug that he was owed at the end of Force Awakens. The uh, that that was one of the things that I sarcastically <laughs> said I wanted to see in this film, and then when I actually did see it, I was like, ah, yes, <laughs> that gave me a warm little feeling inside. So I was happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just real quick before I give my final thoughts, Justin gives his. Uh, we didn't touch on Porgs a whole lot, or on the, uh, the crystal foxes as they're calling them. Um, did you guys, were you on board with both of those? Did you think they were good additions to the story? Uh, I would, to be honest, I was impartial. Um, I think going into The Last Jedi, I was, uh, I was probably on the more cynical side of things when it came to the Pogues. I just, I did purely see them as a, as a Disney cash cow to begin with, <laughs> just because of how heavily they were, they were a focus when it came to the merchandise and what have you. It was just like... It was like they they overestimated the popularity of them before the film had even come out and before people even knew who or what they were, oh. um, just because of the sheer amount of merchandise that came out for them. But I don't think they necessarily offered anything to the story. Um, I think they were purely just there for for the sake of being there, really, for people to sort of go, oh. um, <laughs> they, they didn't. They didn't bother me as much as I thought they were going to. I thought they were going to be a lot more prominent in the film and get in the way a lot and irritate me a little bit. I thought maybe they will be the, the Jar Jar Binks of, of the new trilogy. But um, the scenes that they were in, I laughed at and I enjoyed. So I can't say that they, I can't say that they had any impact on the story, but they didn't annoy me or get in the way as much as I thought they probably would do. So I did ultimately end up liking the part that they played in the film nice matt any thoughts uh, real quick on the porgs or the crystal foxes yeah i agree with steven 100 percent on the porgs like i'm kind of impartial or i feel indifferent like they're they're all right i mean they didn't really bother me um they they were like for some reason for that behind the scenes thing they are all of a sudden just took off on their own and uh once again the hype train and um they're yeah, yeah, whatever i'm glad they they had the funny mo a couple funny moments uh they weren't really annoying i mean but yeah maybe they're there just to be cute and sell plushies i don't know the foxes were okay they're kind of cool they had actually like a plot significance because the beginning before the door closed you see the shot of them and, they, and then the, the camera tracks them going into the the little bunker and then I think Poe or whoever said it's like, oh, where did all the animals go? And then like you see that long shot 
of the crystal fox at the end of the t- like the the bunker but it's like this tunnel and it disappears you're like oh where'd it go and then so like that it actually has some significance it, it's kind of crazy like the one that's just fluff is the porgs just to sell toys and the one that actually has significance for the film is the one that doesn't have like nobody cares about <laughs> like <laughs> there's no figures or anything of the porgs like you know i don't know <laughs> nice uh justin any final thoughts on the film as well as uh, what do you think about the porgs or the vulp texas uh, the crystal foxes from mm. crate I, th- I thought both of those were pretty cool actually the uh little porgs the porgs you know they were they were cute good cgi on those um crystal fox i mean i never would have thought in my wildest dreams of putting crystals on a fox but uh i gotta admit <laughs> <laughs> i gotta admit they did look pretty neat though so yeah nice uh, I enjoyed both. I thought the, the porgs were fun. Just a little fun, you know, element, mostly for the kids and also for merchandise purposes. Um, at the beginning when we saw them, one almost got taken out by the lightsaber. <laughs> I almost expected that to happen. That was uh, funny. It, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, the Vulptexes I thought were, were really cool, or Vulptuses. I forget what the plural form is of, of uh, Vulptex, but uh, those were really, really cool. I You know, I love any canine type element and, you know, kind of like dogs and i thought they were really cool really nice to look at and again like you said matt they did serve a a function for the plot um final thoughts though Uh, i felt like like i said at the beginning i'm still trying to figure out where its place is in the entire uh saga um i really enjoyed it i was immensely entertained by the film it had a lot of things that i didn't expect and you know a few things that um i'm still trying to you know just figure out and you know kind of understand why they they made these decisions in terms of, you know, why they did them. But uh, mm-hmm. overall, I enjoyed it. And I'm really eagerly looking forward to seeing it again tomorrow. And I'm sure that I'll see it again after that. So I was highly entertained. I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a great film. So guys, uh, Steve, Matt, Justin, I'd like to thank you guys immensely for joining me for this 16th episode of Cantina Chatter. Uh, Steve, uh, you have your YouTube channel. Uh, you were one of the first people to... Uh, support my channel when it was just starting out like five years ago and uh um, oh, has it been that long it's yes yeah, it'll be wow. five years in <laughs> april i believe so uh you know thank you so much for for your support and for watching and you know you do an amazing job i try to aspire to be as great as you are <laughs> and um if people want to look you up online other than your youtube channel where else can they find you uh i'm pretty much everywhere to be honest i'm on facebook i'm on twitter uh, and I'm on Instagram as well. Um, on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at the Sith Lord two two nine because Sith Lord two two nine was for some reason taken. Um, <laughs> uh, but on Facebook, I'm just I'm just Sith Lord two two nine, and likewise on YouTube, it's just youtubecom slash Sith Lord two two nine. So yeah, you can find me uh, pretty much everywhere online. Awesome, Matt. Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, you just look up Matt Brando or just uh, my uh, alias for uh, social media is Michael Man Man. So I just look up my Matthew Brando because people <laughs> don't know how to spell that. But uh, I want to say something cool about Steve. Like Steve, oh, his channel, man, he has almost every single figure. I swear to God. Like if I want to look up a figure, <laughs> it's his face with the thumbnail, you know, like he's got everything. So if you guys want Star Wars figures and you're, you're interested in him, like he almost has almost every single one of them on his channel. So <laughs> go look up that dude. Thank you very much. Yes, no problem. Totally. If you guys want to look up Justin, or he's not yeah, anywhere yeah, online yeah, yeah. to be what, found. What's, but... what's, what's Justin's Twitter? <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't I'm just have. Invisible. He's invisible. So if you have questions for Justin, you can tweet them to me, or and right. I'll pass them along to him. <laughs> and uh, you guys know where to find me. iTunes. You can subscribe to the Cantina Chatter podcast there. You can subscribe on Podomatic, SoundCloud youtube be sure to follow on facebook instagram and twitter as well victorious cantina and as always i'd like to thank you for listening to the cantina chatter podcast until next time bye bye